right? Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the application to reflexive spaces. There's a couple interesting lemmas in there. Um, okay. Oh, you have any questions about the homework yet? So far? Anything? Okay. Why don't we have a look at 4.6 then? Um, Okay, so what do we know? What is, what is the definition of reflexive? It's that the second dual is equal to itself. X is reflexive if X double prime, which means the, the dual of the dual, okay, is isomorphic to X, okay, as a norm space. Okay, so X norm, norm space Okay, is reflexive. So this means isomorphic as a norm space. Um, and what did we already see? We saw one of the homework problems. I think I put it in the note 3.8.8, .8, like problem 3.8.8. Um, the, the Hilbert space is reflexive. Okay, Hilbert space, H equals Hilbert space. Where the isomorphism is a Hilbert space isomorphism, in fact. Okay, not just a norm space isomorphism, but a Hilbert space isomorphism. Okay. So that is a reflexive case. We do know one. Um, and um, what do we have in general? We have in general that the second dual contains the original space. So what we have is what we call what we have in general. Um, if um, in general, uh, if F is in X prime, okay, then we get an element of the second dual, G, sub X in X double prime is defined for any X, well actually I should put it if X is in X. Let's put it this way, if X is in X, then G sub X in X is defined for, is defined as follows. So you let, I need to apply G to, G is going to be a linear functional on the space of linear functional. So G of X is going to be applied to an F. G sub X at F, okay, is equal to F at X. That was the canonical definition uh, for F in X prime, okay? Now, and that's going to be linear, okay? Just because uh, uh, if I take a sum of two linear functionals, by definition, uh, it's going to be f1 plus f2 at x is f1 at x plus f2 at x, okay? And the uh, scalar multiplication um, is trivial as well. So that's trivially linear, and is it bounded? Well, g sub x, what is the g sub x? What is the norm of g sub x? That's the supremum um, f in x prime, f unequal to zero, um, g x of f over an absolute value over the norm of f. Okay, that's just the norm of any uh, linear functional. That's the norm. That's the definition. And what does this come out to be? This comes out actually to be equal to the norm of x by 4.3.4. 4. 
So not a, so actually what we have now is we have a norm space embedding, okay? Not just an algebraic embedding of the second. Well, we had what? They had the uh, second algebraic dual is embedded. Excuse me, the, 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 the original space is embedded in the second algebraic dual. Now we actually have the original space is embedded as a norm space in the second dual. Okay. So this was, I'm oh, sorry, this is 4.3 dash 4. This is one of the corollaries to the Hahn Bonnach theorem. Okay. Then if I actually take, well, let me write down the rest of it. This, this, let me just put in one more soup so that you can see the corollaries. It's supposed to be supremum f belonging to x prime, f unequal to zero, f of x in absolute value over the norm of f. Okay. That was 4.3-4 uh, gives that this is equal to the norm of x. Let's have a look at 4.3-4. Uh, I'm not sure if we actually covered it in here. How did that go? <clears throat> well, we quick cover it kind of quickly. How did it follow? We write uh, the the trick is that this is always less than or equal to x. But how do you get it equal to x? You need the inequality. So you have, um, okay, the fact, okay, the fact that the supremum overall f in the dual, f unequal to zero, fx absolute value over the norm of f is greater than or equal to the norm of x, follows from 4.3-3, which is one of the versions of the Hahn Bonnach theorem, how? Well, we said that there was always a uh, functional of norm 1 because given x unequal to 0, we'll assume that x is unequal to 0 here, okay? Because if x is 0, then obviously this is the 0 functional, g is 0. So I'm only going to consider x unequal to zero. If x is zero, the original x, then this is just the zero functional. G of sub x is a zero functional, so I'll assume that x is unequal to zero because given x unequal to zero, there exists um, a functional f tilde with, okay, in x prime, with the norm of f tilde is equal to one, and f of x f tilde at x is equal to the norm of x. Okay, that was our corollary. I mean, excuse me, that is the Hanbonic theorem 4.3-3. There's always such a linear functional. Okay. So if I plug that in now, plug this f tilde in here, the denominator is 1, okay, and the numerator is the norm of x. Okay. So, so you get the equality because you always have less than or equal to here. This is less than or equal to in general. Okay? Less than, less than or equal to by definition of the norm of f. Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. So you get this one. So you get the equality. All right? So what you have then is that... Um, so you have an isometric embedding. Therefore, we have an isometric embedding call it C because that's what we called it before X to X double prime given by X maps to this Functional g sub x. Okay. Okay. And the only question now is whether the range of this isometric embedding 
So we have that the X is, iso is isometrically isomorphic to the range of C. All right? So we have X is isomorphic to the range of C. Okay. But is, it, is the whole of X double prime equal to that range is the question. Okay. As norm spaces. Okay. So the claim is that well, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with this lemma. It turns out that um, the main tool here is that if x prime is separable, then x must be separable. That's going to be the main thing we're going to prove. Lemma 4, 6, 8. If x prime is separable, then x is separable. Okay, so let's apply this now. What is that going to give us? How can that give us anything? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we'll see. Let's see if we can get use that to say anything about the reflexivity property. Suppose this is a simple argument, but let's just go through it, and that'll be the how we know how to use this. Suppose. Um, that x is separable, but x prime is not separable. Okay. So we'll leave we'll proof below. We're going to leave this lemma four six eight proof below. Proof of four six eight below, and apply now. See how it gets used in this context. Suppose. X is separable, but X prime is not separable. What's an example? Example. This is the one key example we're going to keep in mind. L X equals L one. X prime equals L infinity. Let's recall that X. Uh, equals L1 is separable. Um, how do you know that? Do you remember how to prove something inseparable? What did it look like? Um, As a countable dense set, that's because I can basically make finite expansions. Okay, because uh, L1 has a Schauder basis. I roughly speaking, you only have to make finite expansions. Um, I do have some previous notes on this. Um, how would you approximate a given element, let's say by a countable set, in L1? <coughs> What's the idea? I guess, okay. You don't remember that? <laughs> you had to do it on your test, I thought, practically. You had to talk about separability or something like that, didn't you? Okay. Given, uh, <coughs> Given um, x in L1, okay, and epsilon greater than zero, I must find something that approximates x, right, from some set, all right. What I'm going to take is I'm going to take my dense set D. I'm going to take to be, uh, well, let's just take, uh, let's just take m sub k equal to uh, the set of all sequences uh, C1 through CK and then 0, 0, 0, 0 forever, okay, uh, such that uh, C 
uh, i belongs to the rational numbers. Okay, let's just talk about real L2. Okay, all right. So ci equals a plus bi. I'll do the complex case. a plus bi uh, aj plus bji. <laughs> okay, uh, aj and bj belonging to the rational numbers. Okay? K equals 1 to K. That's certainly a countable set. And the union of countable sets is going to be countable. I claim that the union of the M case, union of MK, if I call that M, that's a countable. And I claim it as dense. Countable um, set. And of course, each of these vectors is in L1 because it's finite expansion. It's in C0, in fact. Okay? All right, so the limit is, is zero of the sequence. So <clears throat> this is countable. Um, well, C0 is, is, not, is, is not a good enough condition. But anyway, it's in L1. Okay, each of these sequences is in L1, so all of these MKs are in L1. The union of these MKs is in L1. I claim it's countable and dense. Countable, okay. <laughs> claim is dense. Claim M is dense in L1. Didn't we? I thought we did this once, but maybe we only went over it quickly. How do you prove that? First, okay, given my x and L1, I need to find an element, find an element of uh, M, uh, element uh, Y, in M <laughs> with x minus Y, L1, less than epsilon. That's what I need to do. All right. The definition of dense is that there exists a set so that any, such that any given any element x in the space and in the epsilon greater than zero, there's an element y in the set <coughs> that approximate x within epsilon. Okay. Of course, y depends on x and epsilon. All right. I need to find the y. How would I do that? Well, I could spend half of the epsilon on basically cutting off the tail. Right. I know that. Uh, <coughs> I know that x equals, uh, the norm of x is equal to the summation of a C, uh, j. j goes from 1 to infinity. Maybe I shouldn't have used the c's here again, but because uh, I'm going to save the c. x is equal to c1, c2, and so on. Okay? And so the norm of x is equal to the sum of the cj's. I should have probably called these something else. Um, make it a little bit clearer. These are uh, just complex numbers. C1 through CK. CJ equals that one. Okay? <clears throat> the X is written as C1, C2, and so on. And I'm going to spend half of the epsilon on cutting off X, right? I'm just going to say uh, choose uh, choose uh, capital K so large that the summation uh, little j goes from capital K plus 1 to infinity of the CJ is less than epsilon over 2. All right. And then the other half of the epsilon I'm going to spend by approximating each of the remaining complex numbers in the expansion of X by these complex numbers C J. So then, then choose Y in M sub K actually, uh, sub capital K. All right, with um, so Y equals. C1 up to C capital K and then 0, 0, 0, and so on. All right? With summation CJ minus CJ, an absolute value, less than epsilon over 2. J goes from 1 to capital K. Capital K is fixed from the previous step. And now I fix capital K and now choose these, these uh, complex numbers with, uh, that have uh, rational coordinates so close to the CJ so that uh, I just get less than epsilon over 2. All right, I can do that by the density of, the of these 
CJs in the complex numbers. All right. So I have to do a particular. I could take K. I could just uh, approximate each of the CJs by CJ with epsilon over two capital K. All right. So I could do it individually. All right. And then add them up and get the total error less than epsilon over two. Because k is fixed now, so then I can use it in the next step. So now you do that, therefore, uh, x minus y is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. <laughs> okay, it's, it's uh, equal to summation cj minus cj. j goes from 1 to capital K plus summation cj minus 0. j goes from capital K plus 1 to infinity. And the way we actually... So that's less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 equals epsilon. So then we've got the approximation. Little l1 is therefore separable. What about little l infinity? i got to get this done before I <laughs> go to the bottom of this board because I need to use the lemma 4a. So let's just say, what about little l infinity, which we already did prove was the dual? of little l1. Uh, what about little l infinity? Is this separable? No, because we did go through that before. What we actually have is we have a... If I See, it's necessary that I stop these sequences. Why? Because if I take all sequences of zeros and ones, just straight up zeros and ones, that's uncountable. The set of all sequences of zeros and ones is uncountable. The set of all sequences, uh, should I, what should I call them? I guess um, uh, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and so on. Okay. Such that delta j is equal to 1 or 0 for each j okay that certainly that is a subspace that is contained in I shouldn't call it M well, let's call it a this set is contained in L infinity because uh, you know, there wouldn't be summable. So, for example, if I have infinitely many deltas equal to one, so it's all sequences of, of ones and zeros here. Are you with me? It's all sequences of ones and zeros. That's certainly not in L1, because if I have infinitely many ones, the sum of the ones is infinite. Okay, it's not in, in any LP, but it's in L infinity. Okay, because the, the norm of this thing is just one, if, if there's at least one one, and it's zero otherwise, okay? So this is in, in L infinity, all right, but it's uncountable. Now, just because you have an uncountable subset of L infinity doesn't mean that L infinity isn't separable, because in L infinity itself is uncountable, okay? Obviously, that just doesn't mean anything. But the fact is that any two elements of A are distance at least one, okay? And moreover, if x and y belong to A, then the distance between x, well, then the norm x minus y, okay, is equal to what? Uh, well, if they're unequal to each other. x unequal to y are in A. then the norm of the difference is equal to 1. Okay, so what does that mean? If I did have a countable dense set, okay, well, well, let's see. Well, how would that, how does that go then? How does it go that that's, that's impossible? I want to look and take a look in the book because I don't want to spend more than two minutes on this. <laughs> okay, it's in the first chapter. Okay.
Okay. I think it's in there. Yeah. Density. Or is it? 21. Okay. Okay. I might have to do it without the book. Okay. So why is that the why is it not separable then? Okay. Yeah, on page twenty two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so why not? Okay, so there are uncountably many zeros and ones. The metric on the infinity shows that any two of them which are not equal must be of distance one apart. If we let each of these sequences be the center of a small ball, say of radius one third, these balls do not intersect and we have uncountably many of them. Okay, so that's what I'm going to, so now we take, like all the, if we take, therefore, okay, so what you have is then you have now, if you take the ball of the center of Y and radius, well, I said one third, okay, if you take those for Y, in A, okay, there are uncountably many of these, uncountably many balls, of radius one third. I just need it so that one third plus one third is less than one. Okay, <laughs> okay, and they're and and disjoint, mutually disjoint. Okay. So suppose you had a dense set. Each of these non-intersecting balls must contain an element of M. Okay. So okay, there's the contradiction. Yes. So if M were countable dense set, then for each, for every Y. Okay, in A, there exists an M in M with little m in this ball. I'm sorry, was M the union again of all balls? No, no, M is just something else. This M is just, if there were, kind of, M is nothing. Oh, it's no, just M is just something. Okay, let's just call it something else. It's C, countable dense, or D, or countable dense set. Then there exists a Z in D with Z in this ball. Okay? Then, for every Y in this uncountable collection, all right, there exists a Z in D with Z belonging to this ball. And the balls now are disjoint, though. They don't need it at all. Therefore, you've counted one element of the dense set for each element of this uncountable set. All right? Therefore, you have a contradiction. You've made M into a, le a D into an uncountable set. Okay? All right? You've counted one element of D for each of uncountably many balls because there's no double counting. All right? There's no double counting. In other words, you can't use uh, one Z for uncountably different many balls because there's only uh, each ball gives you a different Z, okay? Each ball gives you a different Z, right? Because the balls are intersecting. If the balls were overlapping, you can have one Z in uncountably many balls, okay? And then you could, then there wouldn't be a contradiction, all right? Okay, but if I only had a finite um, find overlap, in fact, the argument would still hold that I get a contradiction, okay? There's only finitely many balls overlapping, let's say. Then I would still have uh, uncountably many Z's I have to account for. Okay, so therefore there are uncountably many Z's to account for. That's no good. Contradiction. Okay. 
So that's the, separ that's the non separability of L infinity, is the basic argument. He goes through again the argument why there should be uncountably many of these. I think we just said, suppose I did have, if I had all the, if I had counted all the sequences of zeros and ones, then I could count, and I could generate, I could get a contradiction by constructing another sequence of zeros and ones that's not in the list. If I claim I've got a list of all the zeros and sequences of zeros and ones, that I get a contradiction. All right, because again, if I would count the list. All right, if I count the list, because all I have to do is change the diagonal element on that list. In other words, if I had a list, 0, 1, 0, you remember this argument, 1, 0, 0, suppose that's the first element on the list. Then I had another element, in the next, you know, a second element in the list, and so on. All sequences of zeros and ones, a third element in the list, 0, 1, 1, 1, whatever. So my list, somehow I got a counting, a counting, a countable listing here of all the sequences of zeros and ones, then I take the first out, so then I do really have a mapping from the non-negative integers to this set of zeros and ones, of sequences of zeros and ones. Then I just change this first element, okay? I change this second element, I change, and then take the, the sequence composed of those di a diagonal, okay? I change it from zero to, change it from zero to one, okay? Change it from zero to one, change it from one to zero. Okay? And then take the sequence, then that's not appearing in the list. Okay, so there's the contradiction. So it's easy to see. <clears throat> All right, let's go on now. So suppose now that x <laughs> is separable, but x prime is not separable, as in this situation. So I'll give the example L1 and L infinity. All right. Suppose now that x double prime is equal to x prime. Suppose also x double prime is isomorphic to x prime, to x, is normal spaces. Okay, suppose we do, suppose then you do also have reflexive. All right. So then x double prime equals x prime prime is uh, if x prime is separable, then x is separable. Okay, so let's see what do we have then? Um, x is separable, okay, okay, so here it is, yes, then, then x is separable, because How do we have that? I already have X is separable. <laughs> okay, no, no, yeah, yeah, here it is. X double prime equals, that's right, X equals X double prime equals X prime prime. Here's how it goes. That's okay. Okay. Confused. I want to show that uh, X is the dual. X is the dual of X prime, right? So it says whenever I take the dual and say is separable, then the thing that was not the dual was the previous thing is separable also. Okay? So X is separable. Therefore, x prime is separable by the lemma. Okay, so it's a very simple argument. In other words, I've got x prime prime is separable 
implies x prime separable. Okay, that's all we're, that's all we're using. Okay, but this is x. Okay. The lemma says that if I take a space y prime and it's separable, then y is separable. So I'll apply this with y equals x prime. Apply and I e apply apply corollary or lemma with y equals x prime in place of x. I think that's the easiest way to do, just make a substitution. Okay? This says if y prime is separable, then y is separable. So we want to see that lemma. Okay? That's the lemma. A lemma, therefore, if I apply that with y equals x prime, I say that if x, do if x double prime is separable, then x prime is separable. Okay? But x double prime is x. Therefore, x separable implies x prime separable. So I can't have x separable but x prime not separable if I'm going to have a reflexive space. It is possible to have x separable and x prime not separable, as we just saw, L1 and L infinity. But not if I'm going to have the reflexivity. Okay, so if the spaces are reflexive, okay, and x is separable, if x is a separable space, then its dual must also be separable, okay? In order to be reflexive, okay? It must, this dual must also be. So what you, to show non-reflexivity, you show that, well, I've got a separable space and its dual is not separable. That was the situation, all right? Therefore, okay, L1 is not uh, reflexive. I think we mentioned this already before. Okay, but it was a little complicated to see that L, the dual of L infinity was not L1. It looks like it should be, but it's not. Okay, so here's... Four sixteen is always true. Yes, four six eight is true. This is just true. So, we're trying to use four six eight to say, well, okay, bring in this concept of reflexivity. Is it possible that L1 is reflexive? Okay. It's not, because, well, the easy way to see it is that this dual is not separable. <coughs> right, so I think this is the way to look at it. So let's look. So this is a good way to motivate um, studying 468. So let's see if we can get this lemma 468. There's a first lemma, 467, that used to prove 468. So let's get this 468 by taking 467 first. <coughs> Okay, so lemma 467, suppose you have uh, the norm space, and suppose you have a closed sub proper closed subspace, so x is a norm space, y is a subspace but proper subspace of x, y closed subspace. Okay, let x naught be in x take away y, so we'll take an element x naught that's not in y, then the delta equals the infimum over all elements y tilde and y of x naught minus y, that's going to be a positive number. Why should that, why does it have to be positive? Or define. And I'll put the greater than zero in parentheses. In other words, you should really verify that, okay? Delta is greater than zero. Let's put it this way. Let's put it this way, sorry. Delta greater than zero since y is closed. How would it be if delta were equal to zero? Then what you would have is you would have a sequence yn. 
so that x naught minus y n goes to zero. That means y n is converging to x naught. Okay, that means x naught is in the space. Okay, but you assume it wasn't. Okay, so if you take delta equal to zero, then because of the infimum, you know you can approach the infimum by taking a sequence y n. All right, y n therefore approaching x naught. You might say, oh, y n isn't doing something nice. Okay, but if delta is zero, yes, it is doing something nice. Okay, it's going to x naught. Okay. Okay. Yn in y with yn going to x naught. Okay, so x naught is in y. Contradiction. Okay. So you have this thing. You have a positive delta. Then there exists an f tilde belonging to the the dual. That is, you have a bonded linear functional with norm equal to 1 and f tilde of x0 equal to delta. Okay. And I think you actually have a homework problem related to this to deal with it in the Hilbert space case. You've got, um, you're taking, uh, you're thinking of y, y as a plane, so the origin is closed subspace and you've got uh, x naught sitting out here, and you're trying to find, um, and also you've got this, and also there's one more condition, and that is f um, tilde of y is equal to zero for all y belonging to capital Y. All right. So the function evaluates every point in the subspace to zero, okay, and. Evaluate and has norm one and evaluates at x naught equal to delta. Okay. So I can basically separate x naught from y via this f tilde. Okay. I know that x naught is not in y. Because f tilde of x naught is not zero. Okay, <laughs> you know. That's basically what I'm saying. There is this, there exists one of these things that 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 tells you well x naught can't be in y because if it were then f tilde of x naught would be zero. Okay, so I'm separating x naught from y by this this linear functional. Okay. How do you prove that by the Hahn-Bonnach theorem? Let's see. This looks like um, the Hahn-Bonnach theorem 4.3-2. I'm going to I want to define a linear functional that has these properties and then extend it to all of x. So I want to define. So put z proof. Put z equal to the uh, span of of y and this one more element x naught. Okay. Uh, I guess we did it like this. This is how we talked about it. Okay. Okay, in the book. Take y, you need one more element and look at the linear span of that. So then, and we looked at this many times, so any z in z can be written uniquely as z z equals um, y plus alpha x naught. Okay? And then we're going to define F, a linear functional on Z, capital Z by F of Z equals F of Y plus alpha X naught equal to, I want to make it zero when alpha is zero, because I want to have F to be zero on Y. Okay, so that means I just want to make this uh, alpha times some uh, F of X naught, which um, I also want to be equal to, um, I want that to be delta, okay? I want this to be delta, So, because I'm, I'm going to have f tilde equal to f, and I want, um, so in particular I want, um, if 
I take y equal to 0 and alpha equal to 1, when alpha is equals to 1, I want this to equal delta. Okay. Okay. That's linear functional. Okay. If I take two such things, a y1 and an alpha x, alpha 1 x naught, okay, and I have a y2 and an alpha 2 x naught, the linear functional evaluates at alpha 1 delta or alpha 2 delta, add these two terms and evaluates at alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times delta, okay? So it's linear. <coughs> you check the scaling as well, okay? We actually used that argument somewhere before in the proof of the Hanbonic, and we just never wrote it down. Okay. Um, okay. So. You have this thing, what's this norm now? What's the norm of this f? I need it, I want it to have norm one because I want, according to this lemma, I want the norm to be, you know, in the Hanbonic theorem, I preserve the norm, okay? So this property that, that f tilde of y is equal to zero for all y and y is just gonna be a artifact of the fact that f tilde is equal, to, is that f tilde is an extension of f. It's gonna be an extension of f, so, this is this is, looks like an extra property, okay? <laughs> this property and this property look like extra properties, okay? But in fact, those are the properties of f itself. And since f tilde is equal to f, all right, on z, then these properties are going to hold for f tilde when I when I extend using the Hanbonic theorem, okay? So the Hanbonic theorem 432 only tells me that. I can extend f to a linear functional on the whole space that has the same norm as the original linear functional. So in order to identify that this norm is 1, I need to show that the norm of f is equal to 1. So is the norm of f equal to 1? And then conclude, okay, show norm of f equals 1, then by 4, 3, 2. the uh, lemma follows by extension of f to all of x, okay? Because f has these two properties. f of x naught is equal to delta and f of y is equal to zero for all y and y, just simply by this definition of f, okay? So I do have one, all right? I do have one that distinguishes x naught from y, but it's not defined in all of x yet, okay? All right, so that puts a little bit more condition, so I need to show that I can extend it to all of that, all right? And I also need to show that the norm is one. That's, I wanna want that for the next dilemma, okay? Um, all right. So, how do you show the norm is 1? Well, first, you show the norm is less than or equal to 1, then you show it's greater than or equal to 1, <laughs> okay. So, um, let, alpha, let alpha be unequal to 0, show norm f less than or equal to 1. Let alpha be unequal to zero. Put z equals to y plus alpha x naught. And then what do you have? F of z. Uh, remember, this is the norm of f on z. We're only going to work with the norm of f on the small. It's only defined on z. Okay? F of z is equal to uh, 
alpha delta. That's what we said, right? Okay, and absolute value. I can put the absolute value on the alpha because delta is a positive number already. This equals the abs al alpha times the infimum y tilde in y, y minus x naught. Okay. Which in particular, if I should put the y tilde here. Okay. In particular, then, this is less, if I take a particular y tilde, okay, this is less than or equal to a particular, particular y tilde, which is minus 1 over alpha y minus x naught. Y was the original representation of z, okay? Okay, which is equal to um, the modulus of y plus alpha x naught, the norm, okay? So therefore, that's equal to n, which is norm z, so that gives you that f of z is always less equal to z, so the norm of f is less equal to 1. So I'm going to remember the non-bonding theorem, but basically you have a subspace z of the norm space x, and you have some linear functional defined on that, then you are allowed to extend the linear functional to the whole space x with the same norm. That is, you have the norm f sub z given, and then you're going to get f tilde sub x equal to f tilde sub z. So the non-bonding theorem gives you f tilde sub x equal to f tilde f sub z. That's what the non-bonding theorem gets you. Okay, you, you, can, you can always extend so the norm is always at least as big, okay? Then you show that it's actually no bigger, okay? So now I'm going to do the, uh, I need to show still what the norm of F is, okay? The norm of F, well, I'm, I'm kind of having a picture here. How do I show that the norm of F is greater than equal to 1? Now I'm going to use the fact that delta is greater than 0. Uh, because I actually could have gotten away with delta uh, equal to zero at this point. Okay. How do I show the, how do I use that delta is greater than zero? Since delta is greater than zero, you have a sequence y n in y that um, you know asymptotically gives you the infimum. All right. So the norm of f is greater than or equal to 1. Okay? We have yn in y with um, delta equals the limit of the norm of yn minus x naught. Okay? And so let's just call zn that, that difference. Okay? Okay. Then what you have is that uh, the supremum of z over z unequal to zero, f of z over the norm of z is greater than equal to the limit uh, f of z n over the norm of z n. N goes to infinity. But that's simply equal to what? What's f of z n? Um, well. That's whatever, what is f evaluate at zn? yn minus x naught. yn minus x naught, that means the alpha is minus 1. Right? So this is minus delta, and the norm of zn is just the norm of zn. Okay. Uh, let's put the absolute value signs on here. Okay? So I get my delta after the minus sign. All right? <clears throat> okay, Zn is going to delta. That's what this says. Okay, this is the limit Zn, and, and it's a positive number. Okay, the, in the limit. So this is getting equal. Okay, so this is the limit here. N goes to infinity. 
equals delta over delta equals one. Okay. So that means that the norm of f is very greater than or equal to one. Okay. Hence, the norm of f is equal to one. And lemma follows by Hanbanach theorem. Lemma follows by. 4.3-2. Okay. okay. So we've got this little lemma. Now how are we going to use it? We need to still prove this lemma 4.6.8. If x prime is separable, then x is separable. Let's, I'd like to get through that proof. We have, I think, enough time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Questions about this so far? Just see, you know, you, you know you want to get this. So let's just see how this lemma is going to be applied. So proof of lemma 468. <clears throat> um, okay. So here's what we'll do. Uh, we know that x prime is separable. And what we're going to do is consider the unit sphere u prime in x prime. What does that mean? That means all the functionals simply of norm 1. Exactly equal to one, not less than equal to one. So it's the, it's not the unit ball, it's the unit sphere. Okay. Take that, and the claim is first that um, that itself is separable. Okay. How do we show? That's kind of an, he doesn't go through the argument. But let's go through the argument to say that this itself is separable. All right. How do you know that u prime is separable? as follows. Let's just make it a, a quick, well, little computation. All right. Um, there exists, first, there exi by, by separability of x prime, there exists a countable set, a countable sequence, let's say, gn in x prime such that for every f in u prime there exists some g sub n of f okay the n would depend on f okay such that um, the uh, for every f and for every epsilon greater than zero, for every zero less than epsilon less than a half, let's say. Okay, there exists. This also may depend on the epsilon. Okay, all right. There exists one of these g sub n's. All right, let's call it g sub n, where the n depends on f and epsilon. That's the way it works. Okay, there's a countable then set in the whole space. It just means that for each x. In the, or for each element of the space in each epsilon, there's one of these things that's close to it. Okay, and of course the index therefore depends on what, what the element of the space and what the epsilon wants. That's all I'm saying there. So there's no, there's no big such that the norm uh, between f and this g sub n is less than epsilon. Okay, so g n has norm at least a half therefore. Okay, for this particular GN, so maybe I only need some of the GNs. Okay? 
if I took a bunch of GNs which had maybe large norms and so on, I took the original Conover dead set in X prime, I'm going to throw all of them away that I don't need. In particular, if I'm going to have F minus GN less than epsilon, F is in U prime, then the norm of GN has got to be at least a half, right? By the reverse triangle inequality, the norm of GN is equal to the norm of uh, F minus F minus GN, like that, which is greater or equal to the norm of F minus this epsilon, therefore, which is uh, greater which is greater or equal to one minus a half equals a half, and it's also going to be less. The norm of GN is also going to be less than or equal to three halves by the same token by the triangle inequality. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to throw away the ones that I don't need. All right. Throw away the G's that I don't need from the original carnival then set. I still have a carnival set. Okay, obviously. And then what do I claim? Um, now also, uh, now put uh, F sub n equals G sub n over the norm of G sub n, or maybe I should call it not F sub n, but well, I guess that's okay. I'm going to call it an F because that's going to be now in the unit sphere. Okay? Then what do you have? Then you have um, F sub n minus f. Suppose I use that one instead. So I might not, I might not have the distance less than epsilon, but I'm going to have it less than two epsilon or something. Okay? Then what's the dis distance between f n and f? So I'm just going to scale the g. All right. This, can you think about doing that? I mean, if you were, if you had, uh, if you had an f here and some g over here. Okay, my G here, okay, which is inside the disk of radius, well, outside the disk of radius, a half, okay, so this is one half, and this is one, okay, and here's my F on the circle, okay, the, the boundary of the disk of radius one, okay, and I'm approximating uh, F by G, okay, then if I, now I'm going to divide G by this norm so that I get a point on on the circle, okay? So here's g divided by its norm. That has norm 1 then, right? Okay, then I want to somehow say that uh, I'm still not very far away from f. That's all the argument is. You just do a little ditty here to actually do so. You write this as fn is gn over the norm of gn minus f, okay? And write that as the norm is one over the norm of gn I can pull out and put it, the scaling factor in here on the f so that's a gn minus the norm of gn times f okay uh, I want to use the fact that gn is close to f so I'll just uh, Still a little algebra there. This is less than or equal to one over the norm of gn. Maybe a faster way to do it, but this looks okay anyway. Gn minus f plus f times um, one minus norm gn like this. Okay, that's just algebraic identity. And now I just use triangle inequality. This is less than epsilon. That's at least a half. So that gives you worse than, no worse than uh, um, two epsilon there. And then there's this other piece. What is that? F has norm one, all right? And then I have uh, this one minus gn, which is um, at most a half again or something like that. So this is less than or equal to, uh, I don't know what I got here. Uh, so I have, this is at most 2 here from this term, okay, times the norm of gn minus f plus the norm of f uh, times the scalar. This is just a scalar, which is at most uh, 1 plus uh, the norm of gn was at most 3 halves, I guess, uh, 1 minus gn. I guess I have to, the norm of this scalar, how, how big could this scalar be, 1 minus norm of gn? 
number of janitors between one half and three halves. So this is a, uh, just another half. Okay. So, oh, that's not good. How did I do that? I must have made a mistake. Oh, no, 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 no. The GN is close to one. What, uh, actually, what do I have? Is it the norm of, I don't want this. <laughs> one minus the norm of GN. What do I have is that um, the norm of GN is greater than or equal to the one minus epsilon, actually. It's, it's, here I used this for the denominator. I didn't really need to use that. I could use this. This is better. One over one minus epsilon. I'm not cheating you. The one minus the norm of GN. Yeah, GN is between is greater than one minus epsilon. I better use one minus epsilon here so that so you don't see the half. Okay, greater than or equal to one minus epsilon is less than or equal to one plus epsilon. So it's close. Okay, to one. So one minus the norm of GN is actually um, at most what? It could be. Uh, you could go up to 1 plus epsilon and go down to 1 minus epsilon. So there's an epsilon here. Okay, I don't want 1 half, I want epsilon. Okay. So this is an epsilon plus epsilon. So this is 2 epsilon over 1 minus epsilon. Okay. Which is small. Epsilon is bigger than half, which is less than 4 epsilon. Okay? <laughs> okay. There I used epsilon equal to half in the bottom. Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, it's just a little, he doesn't cover that, but it's, it's not a very difficult thing to show. Then you have that u prime is self separable. Okay. So now I want to apply the previous lemma. Geez, I'm afraid I'm out of time. Okay. All right. Um, so there's a kind of, therefore, there exists a kind of a dense set. Fn in u prime, okay, and the norms are all one since Fn norm equals one for every n. Okay, there exists an xn in the original space with um, norm of xn is equal to one. Okay, and maybe I can't achieve the norm fn equal to 1, but I can always achieve that fn of xn would be greater than or equal to a half. Okay, and f, I can always do fn of xn equal to 0.99 if I want. Okay, so I'll just say greater than or equal to a half. Okay, because I know that since the norm is equal to 1, then I can nearly achieve the supremum. The supremum of f fixed n. So I'm doing here, for each fixed n, I'm saying there's existing an x, so that fn of x over the norm of x, okay, norm of x equal to 1, is equal to 1, all right, because the fn was in the unit sphere, okay, if it's in the unit sphere, its norm is 1. If its norm is 1, then the soup is equal to 1. So there's got to be some x that comes as close to 1 as I like, 0.99, for example. So I can put 0.99 here instead of the 1 half, if I like. See what I'm saying? So I'm just saying there's got to be an x that does the job called x sub n. Okay. Maybe I can't get equal to 1, so I can't put equal to 1 here. All right? But I can say at least greater than equal to a half. Okay. Now I'll take... The uh, closed, let's take the closure of the span of all these xn's. Take y equals the closure of the span of this set of xn's. Okay? So it's the closure. I'll go like this. Okay? <clears throat> That's a closed subspace now of x. If y is, not, is a proper sub space of x, then I claim that uh, we'll get into hot water, okay? Notice that y is separable. y is separable, because you had a countable set here, and I can take the, um, again, I can take the uh, complex numbers with rational components as the coefficients to the definition of the span. Closing the thing is not going to uh, change the separability of it. Okay? I just need to know if there's a countable dense set in the span without the bar on it. 
Okay? So that's going to be separable. Again, I'm, I, I cheat you a little bit by not going through all the details there. Okay? That's going to be separable. If y is not equal to x, then by the previous lemma, there exists um, f tilde in u prime. Okay? Because it was with, uh, that is, f tilde norm is 1. Okay? With uh, f tilde of y is equal to 0 for all y in uh, y, and um, f tilde of, of, okay, so that's true. So in particular, f tilde of xn is equal to 0. f tilde of xn is equal to 0 because those are all in this space y. And what do you have? You have fn of xn. Okay, you have one half is less or equal to the absolute value of fn of xn on the one hand. On the other hand, that's equal to the fn of xn minus f tilde of xn, because f tilde of xn is zero, okay, this is q, which is less or equal to the norm of fn minus f tilde times the norm of xn. The norm of xn is one, so this is equal to the norm of fn minus f tilde. Okay, so thus, even though fn is dense, you had a dense subset, you're showing that this difference is always at least a half. That's no good. Therefore, fn minus f tilde is greater than or equal to a half for all n. So fn is not dense in u prime. Okay? <laughs> That's a contradiction. I didn't have to use the delta again here. I just needed to know that I can evaluate that um, f tilde had norm 1 and evaluate it to zero on all of this y, okay? So I get that fn is not dense in u prime. I just use the delta to prove the dang thing, right? All right, to prove that I could get this, this f delta, okay? So I've got a contradiction. Therefore, y is equal to x, so x is separable because y was separable. So in fact, you actually have a way to find a, it's a span of, of these vectors xn, <laughs> okay? It's not very constructive, but it's at least a little bit constructive, okay? Okay, so that's the lemma, okay? Okay. So next time, we'll embark on the um, uniform bodiness theorem. Get various categories there first. Um, is it okay to wait for some notes? I have some notes on it, but uh, are you going to be digging into those now, or do you just want to wait? You can wait. Are you okay to have homework due on Tuesday now? We'll see. We'll see. Okay, <laughs> see if you can get it done. I know some of my other classes, I said, ah, we'll, we'll change it. We'll move it back one day. You know, here it doesn't make that big of a difference because Tuesday to Thursday. So if you want to go back to Thursday, you can go back to Thursday. Do you, do you want to do that? Okay, why don't we make the homework due on Thursday, then you can ask on questions on Tuesday. So now I'm going to move the homework to homework. I don't think, I think we still have enough room, but homework due, uh, homework, what number is it, nine or Seven? Or wait, no, I don't know. Nine. It's nine. Homework nine due. And I'll change the website to um, Thursday, April 13th then. Okay, to give you a little breather. Okay. Okay. It's not a big homework on these little application sections, but uh, give you time to catch up and do a little reading on 4.7. Please try to read up on 4.7 if you get a chance to look at the book over the weekend. Okay. That'll give us a little head start because that's a big section. Mm -hmm.
And I'm going to assign some nifty problems on it. Okay. So you might want to look at it. Okay.